Our next speaker is Chairman and, and CEO of Xerox Corporation. She joined Xerox as a summer en engineering intern over three decades ago and helped turn the company around as a senior vice president through investment in research and development of new products and technology where she oversaw global research. She's a founding board member of the Change the Equation, which focuses on improving United States education system in science, technology, engineering, and math. She's also a member of the American Energy Innovation Council and has been a tireless supporter of energy innovation. Please join me in welcoming Ursula Burns. So thank you for that generous introduction and thanks to all of you for the warm reception. I'm delighted to be here and to share a perspective on your work from the vantage point of a company that has nothing to do with energy. I guess that's the point of me being here, to let you know that we are all impacted by energy, to tell you that we deeply clear, care about your work, and to let you know that our companies, our country, and indeed the planet, all need you to go about your work with a sense of urgency and a sense of passion. 20 minutes is not a long time, so let me get right to um, my discussion. I have three points to share with you. Message number one, companies like Xerox, companies outside of the energy sector, have a deep interest in sustainability and in energy. What you are doing matters to us, and it matters to us big time. Xerox has been working on sustainability for decades, long before green was in vogue. Long before green was in vogue. Our commitment to sustainability began in the 1960s as the financially as well as the socially right thing to do. That early commitment has led us to a fascinating, on a fascinating journey. We pioneered energy reducing technology, things like two-sided copying, print on demand, the use of recycled paper, um, remanufacturing of machines, recycling of toner cartridges, and a propagation of really tough standards for our paper suppliers. The more we have integrated sustainability into our business operations, the more it has become part of our DNA. Now we like to think of ourselves as a leader, still pushing the boundaries of what is possible. That thinking has taken us on some, to some very interesting places and produced some really significant results. Our whole product development process is a good case in point. During the early 1990s, we began to hone in on this idea of remanufacturing. We took back copiers and printers that, we, that would have wound up in landfill. In the past, we leased machines, we took them back, and then we would crush them and throw them away. Some smart engineer looked at the machines and said that most of the parts in it are still pretty good. They're actually still usable, so why don't we reuse them? We had no idea whether there was a market for reusable machines or remanufactured machines, but soon found out that there was a segment of the market that actually preferred reuse and recycling. And the same is true for recycled paper. Um, it's actually, our recycled paper actually sells at a premium today. That type of learning led us to the realization that we could save even more money if we designed up front our machines, our products, from scratch with reuse and remanufacturing in mind. The results have been pretty impressive. We estimate that we have given new life to the equivalent of more than 3 million products. Last year alone, we diverted millions of pounds of waste from landfills. Our commitment to sustainability doesn't stop there. Over the past many years, we've been building a services business that has led us to be essentially neutral on whether a customer uses paper or not. That sounds like a really strange thing for a company that invented copying. We actually work with our customers to help them reduce their reliance on paper, to convert their legacy documents from paper to digital, and to more aggressively move away from paper in the office. More than half of our business now comes from services, and it's led us into places that you would never expect us to be. One example of the impact of this new look on our business is, and its impact on energy is, get ready, parking. Parking, automobile parking. Through ACS, now Xerox Services, the $6 billion business that we acquired last, a couple of years ago, 
we are successfully managing and operating parking systems for more than 30 cities in the United States and nearly 100 jurisdictions in Europe. In fact, we're the world's largest provider of transportation services to governments worldwide. Here's one example of our expertise at work, at work and how it helps the energy problem. In Los Angeles, we're making it easier than ever to find a parking space. By using Xerox's innovation, the city will be able to adjust parking meter rates, unfortunately, according to demand. That will make more spots available at peak times, encouraging the use of public transportation and relieving traffic congestion. That means less use of fuel. Prices will help build, prices will vary, and it'll help build and meet a demand with supply, and it'll help neighborhoods reduce congestion, and obviously, like I said, help reduce energy usage. It's a good example of our services business ACS, working with our technologists in Xerox, teaming up to help cities become more efficient and less dependent on energy. We are also the world's largest provider of automatic toll machines and other processes that rather dramatically cut down on energy usage. By finding a parking space faster or helping traffic more, move more efficiently, we're helping reduce congestion. That may not sound earth shattering, but consider this. America's urban areas wasted 1.9 billion gallons of fuel, that's billion gallons of fuel, in 2010, and 4.8 billion hours of driver's time, there's people driving around trying to find a place to, find, to park. N nor, um, so we work on this, and we are helping to reduce that burden on the environment. Nor are these isolated examples. Across industries and around the world, businesses and governments are recognizing the value proposition of the new Xerox. Let me give you one last I didn't know that about Xerox moment. Many of you in this room are familiar with our legendary Palo Alto Research Center known as PARC. Um, it has a rich history, it you know, helped create things like the graphical user interface and other innovations that are now around the world. PARC researchers have been helping um, to change the world for a very long time and they did this by, competing, by combining a deep science with a deep desire to help improve the, improve the world. It's a remarkable place. It's spinning out a wide array of innovations. Many of them have very little to do with what Xerox directly does. So we changed the model of PARC in 2002 and we, formed, we made it into an independent subsidiary that practices what we call open innovation. It is now, it had, this new model has turned out to be a win-win for us and for people like you in this room. PARC is doing work in many, many areas across many industries, we, and including the government, the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy, for example. In fact, we have a major clean tech program that is right up your alley. We're helping to make solar electricity a practical reality through work we've done with a company called Soul Focus. We're helping data centers manage their energy uses and energy demand better, and we're improving batteries. We're applying that know-how to everything from electric vehicles to portable power. And we're deep in developing new technologies for clean water. Steve, C Steve Hoover, who's the CEO of PARC, and Scott Elrod, who's the Vice President and the head of PARC's clean tech program, they're here today. And I hope that you'll be able to stop by and see them. They're in booth number 301. Um, so get by. They are great minds, and all of PARC is packed with great minds, and they're always looking for people to partner with so that they can actually apply their exciting work on a broader basis. So be sure to tell them what your problems are and what your challenges are, what you're grappling with, and you may be able to get some help from PARC um, in solving those problems. Message number two. We're playing for some really high stakes. I mean, I'm, pe I'm preaching here to the converted. When I was born, I looked this up, this is really interesting. There were a little over two billion people on the planet when I was born. I was born over 50 years ago. By the time I started my career, which was 25 years later, um, the population of the world had grown to 4 billion people. By the time I retire, it will be about 8 or 9 billion people. That's four times what I, the population when I was born. And I don't have to tell you that um, this is not sustainable. Not that the population growth is not sustainable, but how we use energy is not sustainable. It, the rich use more, obviously, than the poor do and the poor are trying to get richer every single day. And it's been estimated that if the world's population had the same standard of living that we have in this country, that we would need three planet Earths to house them. 
Obviously, we don't have three planet Earths. We only have one. So I don't have to preach to the choir on this one. Um, you, got, you get it, and that's why you're all here and why I'm all here and why I'm involved in energy um, at all. You know that the solution to lifting the world's poor out of poverty, hunger, and disease is, is economic development. But we also know that unbridled economic development done in the old way will destroy our planet. So it's quite a conundrum, but fortunately there is a middle ground. And you've heard it a lot, and it's called sustainable development. That's the term that gets thrown around um, a lot. It defines a place where the world's economies, the societies, and the environment can all thrive in a harmonious state. Some people call it the triple bottom line. I like to call it the triple bottom line as well. Operating the world, businesses in a way in which the economies can grow, societies can benefit, and the environment is still protected. And here's the really good news. It's not nearly as difficult as we once thought. Companies such as 3M, Cisco, P&G, Xerox, and many others are making major reductions in waste, major reductions in energy usage, or water usage which, while saving billions of dollars. I'm sure every company here um, can show similar results. It's um, all really good stuff, but it's not nearly enough to, say, to cause anyone to declare victory yet. We desperately need communities like ARPA-E to provide a quantum leap forward. The good news about the progress that we've made on the corporate side so far is that it's being driven not only by the financial bottom line, but it's being driven by the expectations of our customers and by our shareholders as well. Just about every RFP that we compete for, just about every single one, um, has a clause in it today that has something to do with sustainability or green. Either we have to help them reduce energy, we have to help them reduce waste, we have to help them reduce paper utilization. And that phenomenon means that sustainability itself is sustainable because clients, our customers, our shareholders are asking for it as well. When customers and their service providers are aligned, no one is going to turn back. No one is going to actually push against this wave that's happening. This is good, but it's clearly not good enough. Innovation like raising children takes a village. So we have in this room, I think, the scientists, the innovators, the universities, the corporations, government entities, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists to make a really fundamental change in this problem. I think we have in this room um, the capacity to make magic happen. But I would argue that we need to lengthen our stride and quicken our pace. And that gives me to message number three. And so it's a theme that I'm on in many, many different areas, education, energy. We all need to become a little bit more impatient with the status quo. I believe that we all need to shift the emphasis in our thinking from why we can't create more jobs or why we can't um, have a better educational system, from why we can't Im improve our competitiveness, from why hunger and poverty can't be eliminated, to how we can do it. In other words, we all need to become a little bit more impatient with the status quo. Some of our most revered people have been impatient people. Bill and Melinda Gates describe themselves as impatient optimists. Melinda Gates has said that the world is getting better, but it's not getting better fast enough. I actually agree. Although a lot of people, most notably Robert F. Kennedy, get the credit, it was actually George Bernard Shaw who first wrote. Some people see things as they are and ask why, and others dream things that never were and ask why not. We need to stop build, hiding our impatience and start celebrating our impatience. Let our impatience show, let our people, since our people do emulate their leaders, I think that we have to show them that we are impatient. We have to walk the talk and let them see that it's okay to be impatient and to be a little bit frustrated. We've been told our whole lives to be patient, to don't shake things up, it'll work out, don't stick your neck out too far, you can't really fight City Hall. I think all of those things are essentially bull. When I was introduced, you heard that I grew up in the uh, housing projects of New York City. And at that time, I had three strikes against me. My gender, obviously I'm a woman. My color, obviously I'm black. And my class, no more obviously, but I was back then poor. The Xerox gave me an opportunity, and I provided the hard work. My impatience stemmed from my passion to make sure that everyone in this world, not only in this country, has the same opportunity that, that I had. My impatience stems from an abiding belief that our best days are actually ahead of us. 
If only we act now to secure the future that um, our children deserve and that, that their children deserve. And my impatience stems from an abiding belief that democratic institutions and capitalist economies are humankind's greatest hope to build an equal and just society. So if I get a little impatient, I hope that you'll forgive me. Actually, I hope that you'll join me and become impatient around, as well. Look around you. The brain power to build a sustainable world is here. And fortunately, there are many more like you outside of this room around the world. Think about what we can do, and, you know, if we can provide clean and sustainable energy for all of the world. And if you'll pardon the metaphor or the pun a little bit, this is not, a Don, this is not Don Quixote tilting at windmills. This is harnessing science to transform the world. This is about being part of the solution, not part of the problem. It's about having hope, working hard, and being diligent. This is about believing that one person, one institution, as small as one person and one institution are, can make a huge difference. And everyone must try. This is about being impatient and about doing something about it and about not forgetting your role in the bigger world. Xerox, as I said, is not an energy company. But we focus heavily on not abusing and misusing the things that, the grace, and the things that have been given to us. It's not the, if it's not the people in this room, then my question is who? And if it's not now, my question is when? Thank you.